Greetings, I'm Lady Mareswind of Cawdor. This video originated as a post on Better SCA Camping right after we all got back from Penzik last year. You'll recognize some of the material from the period furniture video. For example, the ideas for the bed rail connectors or the linen fold paneling. Other suggestions, like the glow tape on flashlights and the leather book cover that hides a cell phone, are new. There are over 40 tips for Penzik on this video. I invite you to take those that are useful to you and make them your own. The first time I went to Penzik, I made the trip on impulse. I had only a few days to prepare. I didn't know what to expect, so I packed as if I were going camping with the Boy Scouts. I brought a nylon tent, camping cots, sleeping bags, and a cooler, as well as our entire Renfair wardrobe. I hadn't pre-registered, so we paid at the gate, then set out to find a place to camp. I didn't know my way around. I found it extremely stressful to creep along on narrow roads searching for a place to camp that hadn't already been claimed by somebody else. Lesson number one, camp with a group. It's a lot more fun to arrive at Troll and know where you're supposed to be than it is to drive around for an hour searching for a place in single camping. Plus, you're with people you know and an encampment usually has amenities like showers. So after a lot of driving around that first Penzik and getting out of the car and walking around and getting back in the car, we finally found a place to camp and settled in. I'd planned to cook over the campfire like we did in Scouts. I knew that Penzik was a tent city. I'd seen it from the highway a year or two before. But what I didn't know was the important part of tent city was city. Before we even dug a fire pit, we learned there was a restaurant district in the center of town, right between the two enormous shopping malls. We ate extremely well our whole stay, and we never did light the campfire. Lesson number two. Penzik is a camping event, but it's the kind of camping where, if you want, you can sleep in beds and eat in restaurants. Here are some tips and tricks to make camp setup faster and easier. People say that you can make a flagpole from PVC pipe and plop it over a tent pole pin. Even if the fit is a little bit sloppy, it won't blow away. I didn't believe it. I thought, surely it needed a longer pin, a tighter fit, or some kind of fastener at the bottom. But no, People are right. All you need to do is plop the pole over the pin. Finials prevent rainwater from getting through the grommets into your tent. Because I can't reach the top of a perimeter pole, it takes me a long time to install the finials. I usually do a few and then quit. I switch to using cone washers. Cone washers plug the space between the pin and the grommet. They work extremely well. Several thunderstorms later, and I still have a dry tent. Best of all, you can put the cone washers on the pins while you're still at home. It's one more chore you don't have to do during setup. I initially got a slant wall tent because I thought it looked nice and because it had more floor space inside. However, the slant walls have to be staked down right away or else several feet of ground cloth are left out in the open. Staking the slant walls can take hours, by which I mean I'm still making adjustments the next day. I replaced the slant walls with a set of straight walls. They looked good as soon as they were hung, before they were staked at all. Thus, this arduous and time-consuming chore can be demoted from must do it immediately to can get to it at leisure. Another thing I would recommend is to take a sharpie and mark the ground cloth with the positions where the poles will be. That way, there's no guesswork when you're setting up the tent. Using bed rail connectors, I can make furniture that snaps together. It used to take me ages to assemble everything, but now I can put everything together in minutes. Over the tent pole hooks are a wonderful thing. 
I might forget to install them when I'm putting up the tent, but there's still time to install them afterwards. These shelves are hanging from over the tent pole hooks. The tapestry and the fire extinguishers hang from them also. They're very useful. I use tent pole grabbers, also called gravity hooks, to hang the iron chandeliers. Chandeliers that go around the pole aren't a good choice for me because I forget to install them until after the tent is up and the tent pole can no longer be lifted. Now we're going to look at some ideas for decorating the inside of the tent. Warning. Every effect shown in this section is fake. The original of this tapestry hangs in the Museum of Cluny in Paris. You can make a convincing copy by taking a JPEG to the office store and having it printed as a vinyl banner. This one was made by Vistaprint.com. They printed it up for me on a 4x4 sheet of vinyl, all for under $50. It's waterproof, so I don't worry about it getting damaged. There's nothing more genuinely period looking than a real rope bed. These, however, are fake. The ropes are threaded like a running stitch the length of the boards. I chose not to make a real rope bed because threading the ropes would take too long. Similarly, there's nothing like real, hand-painted artwork on a wooden chest. These are fake. They're decoupage, which is French for decorated with paper cutouts. This linen fold paneling isn't real either. It was also done using decoupage. And so was this carved wooden chest. When it comes to decorating furniture, if you have a can of polyurethane and a color printer, you can rule the world. Maybe it's just me, but I'm hinky about burning down my tent. That's why my candles are fake. They're not only fake, they're operated by remote control. I think they worked out pretty well. My fondness for fake candles extends to fake torches. I bought them to hang from shepherd's hooks, flanking the entrance to the tent. But I also used them to mark the tent stakes so no one would trip over them at night. This concludes the section on how to fake a fabulous tent interior. This section is about small conveniences that will make living in your tent more comfortable. One of the best things I brought to Penzik was a RAV charger. This one could charge a laptop twice or a cell phone five times. It will charge anything with a USB port, a lantern, a fan, even children's electronic games. Some people sit in their cars with the engine running to charge their cell phones, and some have solar panels set up outside their tent. I liked the RAV charger better because it was small enough to carry in my writing box and it was totally reliable. Once when I woke up in the middle of the night, I reached for a flashlight which got away from me and rolled under the bed. I spent considerable time on my hands and knees, pawing the ground cloth in the pitch darkness in search of it. Not fun. Later, I realized that if it had been wrapped in glow tape, I wouldn't have had that problem. Also, it's a very good thing to have the flashlight on a lanyard. I'm referring to the risk of losing it in a porta castle. That would be, according to Martha Stewart, a bad thing. I mentioned earlier that the candles in my tent are fake and that I turn them on and off with a remote control. What I failed to mention is that, originally, the table tapers and the chandelier candles weren't all on the same remote that led to a certain amount of fumbling to find the right remote devices. I bought new candles, all the same brand, in order to get them all on the same remote. It's a small thing, but a great convenience when you're already in bed and want to turn the lights off. The first time I brought a period tent to Penzik, I knew enough to attach lines to the vent flap so that it could be opened and closed. However, my technique left something to be desired. When I wanted to close the flap, I tied it to one of the finials I meant to install but hadn't yet and threw it over the ridge pole. During the day, this was mildly amusing, provided I didn't hit anyone. 
It was much less amusing at night, when fat raindrops struck the tent canvas, and I rushed outside in bare feet in my nightgown. Our baron told me to rig the lines so the vent flap could be closed from the inside. That was a terrific idea. The last tip for this section is to wear a sleep mask. The morning sun comes early at Penzik, and it shines right through the thin canvas tent walls. If you don't want to wake up at 6 a.m., wear a sleep mask. Staying organized. This is a short section because I'm not that organized. I spend so much time planning how the inside of my tent is going to look. I imagine something right from the pages of Better Homes and Castles. But after the first day, I have something that looks more like exploding dorm room. Yet none of it is laundry or unmade beds. It's the tent poles that never got used, or the baskets that once held the ropes. I heard some excellent advice, which was, don't park the car until you've totally finished setting up. That way, you can put the stuff that's left over in the car. The thing that helped me the most was extremely simple. It's a see-through zipped bag for travel. Truthfully, Ziploc bags would have worked just as well. I have six or eight of these in all. Then I ran into a problem of never knowing which wooden chest the pouch I was looking for was in. I finally solved the problem by putting all of them in the same chest, which I kept at the foot of my bed. I also like shelves for storage, mainly because I can see what's on them. But one word of advice, only put things on shelves that won't break. A friend of mine put a bottle of good scotch on a shelf hung from the poles of his tent. Tents and tent poles move in the wind, so his advice is, don't store expensive scotch on shelves. I also like pegboards for the same reason I like shelves. I can see what's on them. The pegboard also lets clothes air out and dry. And one last tip, although I don't have a photograph for it, is to have a basket to keep shoes in. It keeps them from getting scattered all over the floor. Now let's talk about some simple things you can do to take your garb to the next level. Let's say you have your garb completely put together. You've assembled tunic, belt, pouch, and dagger. Period headgear can bring your look to the next level. Headgear includes hats, hoods, coifs, which are worn by both men and women, and veils. In a discussion of headgear, I would also include a mention of false braids. They look surprisingly natural, so I decided to try them out myself. I think that worked out pretty well. Or suppose you want the look of two coils of braids, one over each ear, framing your face. Or what my mother used to call cootie garages. Then you buy two headbands. Attach them together by the elastic and drape them over the top of your head. I tried that too, and I thought it worked out pretty well. You do have to wear a veil, though, to hide the elastic. Another thing that will make your garb extraordinary is period footwear. Let's have a look at turn shoes, one of the most widely used methods of construction. This is a turn shoe, so named because it's sewn inside out and then turned. Notice how the lace is tied with only one loop. This is absolutely authentic for medieval shoes. Turn shoes come in many styles but they all have the distinctive seam between the sole and the upper. I expected the soles to be uncomfortably thin on the graveled roads of Penzik. I was pleasantly surprised when they turned out to be comfortable for the whole day. You can buy turn shoes at Penzik. Several different merchants carry them. You can also find them online. Here are some tips for when you're out and about, enjoying your day at Penzik. Here's something I wish I'd heard of earlier. If you buy a souvenir mug at the Beast and Boar, for the rest of Penzik, you can refill it for free. In addition to lemonade, they have iced tea, fruit punch, 
and in the morning, coffee. Their coffee is excellent, by the way. They give you a map of Penzik when you check in at Troll. It took me years to discover that the roads of Penzik exist in Google Maps, even though, like Brigadoon, they exist for only two weeks of the year. As a newcomer, you can use your phone as a GPS to navigate through the site. The red dot will even show you where you are. I was out walking one night a few Penziks ago, and a gentle asked me for directions to Brewer's Road. I described the route as best I could, but I later realized I'd given bad directions that Brewer's Road was barely a hundred feet away. If I'd known to look at Google Maps back then, I would have known better. In spite of it being a period setting, phones have many uses at Penzik. Living outdoors, we're highly attuned to the weather. Phones can be used to learn the temperature and humidity and to see the radar weather map. There are always going to be thunderstorms at Penzik. It's just a matter of when. People also use their phones to read the thing, where they can see the latest updates to Penzik University's class schedule. And phones can be used to receive texts, warning when the cannons are about to be fired. I use the phone to keep track of my children. I allow them to range more freely at Penzik than I do at home so it might otherwise be harder to round them up when it's time for dinner. And you couldn't plan a Pokemon Go raid without them. I like to carry my phone inside what looks like a prayer book. There are a number of styles to choose from on Etsy. I like to wear a Fitbit at Penzik. If I'm going to take 21,000 steps in a day, I want to get credit for it. Another small but important tip for when you're out and about is to have something with you to carry things in. I like to bring a canvas tote bag. Over the course of the day, I usually pick up multiple handouts from classes, as well as things I've bought from the merchants. Elizabethan women carried a basket over their arm when they went out. It's said that you could put a whole lot in one basket. Medieval people also carried baskets like modern backpacks. You can get them at Penzik from our own basket man. There's something else you may not have heard if this is your first time at Penzik. Many people who come here are home brewers. However, none of them have liquor licenses, which means they can't sell alcohol. So all of the beer, mead, and cider in the taverns is free. I heard one proprietor say that it's not a business, it's an expensive hobby. Keeping that in mind, a decent person knows to tip generously. In this final section, we'll talk about how to manage the heat at Penzik. The water at Cooper's Lake is clean and safe to drink, but it tastes like iron, except at the archery range where they have city water. When I first saw people wearing tankards on straps, I assumed it was a Ren Faire thing and meant, I like to go to the taverns. Not so. It's a hydration thing. There are water stations all over Penzik, but they don't provide cups. You'll also see vending machines that sell Gatorade. The camp store also carries Gatorade. A paramedic told me that Gatorade isn't very good for rehydration. It's an electrolyte replacement drink, but does little else. And someone else said you have to be mindful of what electrolytes you're trying to replace, sodium or potassium and magnesium. Many people make sconja bean and bring it to Penzik. Some encampments have coolers of it for common use. Sconja bean is a rehydration drink from ancient Persia. It's made from vinegar and cucumber and flavored with mint. I would make it less sweet than the recipe calls for because sugar is dehydrating. Sconja bean works because vinegar has rehydration properties and restores electrolytes. For the same reason, you might try shrubs, which were vinegar-based drinks popular in 18th century England. In my opinion, here's how the three options line up. There's debate on the subject. Do they hydrate with electrolytes, but dehydrate with sugar? And are they even the right electrolytes, 
sodium versus potassium and magnesium. All I can say is try them out and see what works for you. Finally, many people swear by Noom tablets. You dissolve one in a glass of water to restore your electrolytes. Now let's talk about what to wear to beat the heat at Penzik. I would recommend wearing only linen or silk. Surprisingly, cotton is just too hot. My persona is Norman French, so I normally wear a knee-length overdress over a cotton shift. But not at Penzik. I won't make that mistake again. The first night of my first Penzik, it was my great good fortune that some of the merchants were still open at nine at night, and I was able to buy a linen dress that felt cool and comfortable. Even in humidity so high, I felt like I was wearing it. What I learned is, cotton is too hot for Penzik, and multiple layers are unbearable. Northern Europe just doesn't get the heat and humidity that we do. Coifs are worn by everyone, men, women, and children. People say that they feel cooler when they're wearing one. Another trick I heard is to soak your veil in the melted ice water of your cooler and then put it on. You could also go out with wet hair. Straw hats are everywhere at Penzik. I'm much more comfortable when I'm wearing one. I like to tie a cord under the chin. That way, I'm not always chasing it down the street when the wind picks up. If you don't have these things, you can find them in the marketplace. In fact, it's said that you could show up at Penzik with nothing but a well-endowed purse and buy everything you needed in the marketplace. This isn't period, but one thing you see from time to time is a battery-operated fan that sprays mist. Speaking as a veteran swim team parent, I can tell you that these are a good thing. Another thing that some people find useful is a first aid ice pack. It's worn on the back of the neck to make the heat more tolerable. And now for the last topic, staying cool in the tent. If you possibly can, install a vent flap in your tent. Hot air rises and it will get out through the vent. Choose a pale colored ground cloth. Pale colors don't get as hot. And finally, consider using clip-on battery-powered fans. These are rechargeable through a USB port, and they can give you some relief from the heat. So that's it. This video is based on a message I posted to Better SCA Camping. I wanted to thank everyone who shared their comments or offered useful corrections. Thank you for listening. And if you have any other questions or comments, please don't hesitate to email me directly.